Thank you for joining us for this episode today. I am stoked to share with you a movie about myopia. This is called Losing Sight Inside the Myopia Epidemic. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thanks again for joining us. I'm so excited to uh, be joined by Jane Weiner and to share some of the amazing work that she has done with all of you. Jane, thank you for hanging out with me on the Myopia Podcast. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you, uh, I actually saw some of your work um, probably a year and a half ago in uh, in preparation of this video that we're going to be talking about, but then was reintroduced to you by uh, our mutual friend uh, Tom Aller, and uh, he's just a, a great guy. How how do you how do you know Tom? I actually met Tom in China. Okay, at the IMC in China. Yeah. Um, that was my first kind of adventure out, and the the organizers of that meeting were kind enough to let me do a poster, a scientific poster, okay. but it was a poster for, for the upcoming film. So, Got it. Got it. Cool. <laughs> so, Jane, why don't you tell my audience a little bit about your background, because they... You know, are you an, an an eye doctor? Are you, you know, in the medical field? Just get, get, get us a little bit of your background. Okay. Um, I'm a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been, I made my first film in 1972. So I've been doing it for a long time. Um, I'm what's sort of known as an independent filmmaker, although I've worked for, I've made programs for television, all kinds of television all over the world. Um, I do mostly documentaries and, um, and the way I got into this was that, well, first of all, I do, I often get involved in science documentaries. Mm. And while I always had my best, my close friend, Josh Wallman to bounce things off of, he was a vision scientist and a neighbor and a friend. And so, um, that's. Uh, that's sort of where I started with getting into science, but we never talked about his science. I knew what he mm. did, but I just, you know, we never do it. He li- he likes it. He loved, he loved to talk about it to people who understood it, like his, okay. but to other people, uh-huh. we talked about movies and books and, you know, things like that and, and food. <laughs> and so, um, so then when, uh, then he passed away rather s- quickly, suddenly. And uh, I was, um, I was at a memorial for him at CUNY in New York. And, you know, people came from all over the world. And I, um, and somebody, oh, what they conducted this memorial like a, like a science uh, conference took, it was a whole day event. And people got up and they talked about how they had worked with Josh in myopia and other things there were he, he wasn't just a myopia guy and uh and somebody said something about the myopia epidemic that was the mm-hmm. first time i ever heard it and i looked around the room and i realized that i knew at least half of the people in the room and all of them were really engaged in myopia in vision science okay. and so um so I, lo- I started looking into it, you know, going on web and now this was 2015, I think, you know, going on the web and look at trying to, and I realized that, uh, although I'd taken, I, you know, I had took pre-med in college. Um, and so I had a pretty solid kind of, you know, biology and chemistry background. The stuff about eyes was way, way beyond me. And my experience with doing science programs is to make something for the whole family not and so you know i i try to stay away from scientific jargon because when you're watching a movie and a word comes up that you don't understand you stop you stop watching you say what what was that right so i've always tried to make things more accessible and uh and so i called up uh several different people and asked them if they would help me Mm. teach me this science 
So and what while I... you while you were at this memorial, is this kind of this is when this concept dawned on you? How do you how do you go from, huh, we should do something like this to actually get the ball rolling in the film industry? Is it is it where you're just started yeah, talking was... to people? I, I started talking. I wrote up. Well, first I talked. I did a lot of interviews with the you saw the long list of the people who were yeah, who are huge involved in this. Yeah. And I started and, and many of them I've known for more than 30 years. So they it, and they knew my work. So it wasn't yeah. like I was a journalist calling up trying to get information. And so um, I asked them all the same questions. I had a list of questions and I tried to get them to talk without falling into the jargon thing. So that was that was a challenge. And then um, and, but that way I could sort of do casting. Mm. Um, by having them speak to me as though I told one, speak to me as though I'm six years old. And he said, a six year old would never watch this. <laughs> and so and I changed it to nine to <laughs> try to, anyway. Um, so I, I sort of got my head around what myopia was, what myopia control was, how, um, uh, how the re how the research got started in the mid seventies and what they were doing and things like that. And, um, and so I wrote up a proposal and I sent it to uh, a European television company mm. and they thought it was a great idea. They thought it was so great that they gave the proposal to somebody else to do. Uh -huh. Which so, and the proposal had the list of everybody's name. So uh. that called everyone. And, but I didn't say in the proposal, anything about the lenses. I just said they are developing lenses that will slow this. I didn't yeah. say, I didn't give away the goods, except for light. There was a lot of talk about light because there had been an article in Nature, I think, um, that talked about Ian Morgan and, and Kathleen Rose uh, uh, work in concerning yeah. light. And so, so they ran with it. They made a, they made a film and it, and it went all over the world, but it didn't really talk about the, it, it didn't approach it the way I would have. So, but it meant that it stopped a lot of, if a television organization buys a film about a certain subject, they have to wait until that contract is over before their accounting department will let them buy another one. Okay. So that halted so, uh, and slowed things down, which, which brought me to, you know, kind of the next question I had is, how do you go about getting funding for something like this? Because uh, well, this is this is incredible work, lots of travel, obviously an incredible amount of your time and other people's time. How do you get something like this funded? Normally, you get a television uh, involved for the kind of base funds, and then you have uh, you get sponsors and donations and things like that. Um, if, but I want this to be on public television and yeah. public television has very strict rules about who funds something mm. at the filmmaking stage. If you watch public television and someone's and they, it, you know, at the beginning, they say this film is sponsored by and they have a you know blurb and then they have a list of people um, that when once they accept a film, then you can start going after that money. But before that, you have to be very careful. So I, Cooper Vision came in, Essilor came in, Zeiss came in for smaller amounts of money. So we had money to get started. And so I was going around and I was going to all the conferences to learn more and to meet more people. And that's how I met Tom. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Australia talking to people uh, there and uh, on my way to New Zealand because um, I wanted to get in touch with the people who were at the very beginnings of research uh, for, for this problem. But, uh, n everybody knows something about it now because it's on television, you know, they're, they're news stories and all that. But my interest is to show the whole picture. How did, how did this start? Who did the first testings? Who developed the first lenses? How were they developed? You know, kind of getting in under under the covers a bit to see what's going, you know, what was going on. Um, and COVID hit. 
-hmm. And I got on a plane and flew back to, I live in Paris. I'm not there right now. I'm in LA, but um, uh, I flew back to France and it was a huge shutdown. I mean, we were really locked in. We had to have special passes to go out the front door. Um, and so because I have glaucoma, I walk, I have a white cane. And so the people in my building don't know how well I see or not, I don't see. And during that lockdown, we were allowed, if we were handicapped, to have somebody come help us. So I told her that somebody was going to help me regularly with the computer. And Larry, who, had, who was our editor, who had been working on it up till that point, started coming three or four days a week uh, for three or four hours. Mm. That's how we put together the now 27 minutes of the work in progress. Um, now, there's one thing I have to tell you about you're going to broadcasters. Um, apart from the, the broadcaster who hired somebody else to do a movie, um, many of them didn't know anything about this. They had never heard of it. And I was accused of fake science. Mm. Interesting. It's They'd and never this heard was of by it. the television community. By the television people. This isn't wow. the first time it's happened to me. I proposed a film about plastics years ago in 2000. And I got a letter from Dutch television saying, we've never heard of this. You know, the dangers of plastics, chemicals. And uh, and say, they said, We're, we've never heard of this. So we don't believe this is true. So uh, Jane, I was the, the crazy thing about this is you're you're in the lay community being accused of false f science you can understand how sometimes patients are a little bit skeptical when we bring this up to them and they're like oh you're just trying to you know you know sell me some snake oil right this exactly. is just so interesting exactly. that on your side as well as sometimes we hear it it's like well i don't know right interesting right, right. But, but that's also why i wanted to do this film because my dad was a photographer and myopic, and he ended up with a detached retina and glaucoma. And so yeah. he had to change his career, and that was really serious for our family. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, when, when this all started, I didn't know, I knew I had eye problems, but I hadn't been diagnosed. And so it was during the filming that I found out. Uh -huh. So, um, because I had been complaining so much about my eye problems, but in any case, my jo my job is to let people under get people to understand this from a lay position, yeah, and and not necessarily. I my emphasis to blame near work, not necessarily screens. Near work is screens uh, comprise near work, but because. The myopia epidemic actually started about 50 years ago in mm -hmm. China. And so, you know, we, we mustn't forget that those kids reading under the covers, like me, at night with a flashlight, uh, were doing just as much near work as kids holding up their iPhones. So Jane, um, what, what other things kind of surprised you in in your learning about this that, you know, eye doctors may find uh, you know, I, I care providers might find surprising like, oh, like, you know, we blame screens all the time. Right. So this is kind of but to your point, well, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. The, what other the, things the research, the research in um, in, in light mm -hmm. and getting kids outdoors, mm -hmm. um, which is also connected to circadian rhythms. Yeah. And so that for me, that was really one of the clinchers. It was like morning light is really important. And so you need to get kids outside. But for instance, Ian Flitcroft taught me that driving kids to school in the backseat of a car is not getting them outside, even if they look out the window because of the way the eyes work. And so it, you know, there are things like that, that people just don't know because it's deep in the science. And yeah. uh, and not better to throw them in the back of the pickup, right? So throw them in the back and that gets them outside on the way to school. Right, something to get them outside. But uh, as I wrote to you, you know, we've all I've been doing uh, audience testing with kids. Yeah. And it's pretty amazing because I never say anywhere in the sample that we have that you shouldn't look at your phone. 
We just mm-hmm. show people looking at it. We, and every, in every test se- session that we've done, the kids have got, they got the message by watching mm. the film without being told. And it's them who come up with solutions about what to do, less, less screen time, things like that. So, yeah. um, the, I mean, my, my goal is to let people discover these things. Yeah. yeah. In an easy Jane, way. Share, share a little bit about the film. So you've got 27 minutes of, of data, of information right now. You know, uh, we're going to message everybody that they can go and watch a teaser, a two minute teaser on the website. But tell us a little bit about what the film is about and, um, you know, who it's directed to and so forth. Okay, so it's direct. The film is directed to a general audience. Uh, My idea is that it's for adolescents and their families. Mm hmm. And so that's why we try not to use jargon and we try to make things simple and clear. Um, prof- eye care professionals might consider it a little bit, sometimes a little bit redundant, but I've done many, many, many films for young people. And I know you can't, they don't get it on the first, first mm. mention of something. You sort of have to mention it, then explain it, and then go deeper into it. So, mm-hmm. um, and the arc of the film it's a personal film. I'm in it. And, uh, and I, I'm in it as a way of telling the story. So I lead you through all these different things and I'm the one talking to everyone. Um, and I'm asking the dumb questions. So, uh, so that's, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm the, used to that, though, by the way. I'm used to asking dumb questions. I do it all the time <laughs> right. on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is that the when you make a film for television, it has to have a happy ending. Yeah. And, you know, the happy ending is this, you know, this surely should be um, the kids need help and doctors need to, eye doctors need to know about this and school teachers and parents and all that. Um, and But it's expensive. And so uh, we have to deal with that. But anyway, just to back up just a bit, the way we get these things off the ground is we get a little bit of money and then we do big fundraising drives. Mm. And, and we did one in November, last November, mm. and that was, uh, we got 58 countries, I think, involved. Wow. Um, and we did three panel discussions, one in uh, Asia Pacific, one in the Americas, and one in, um, one in Europe. Yep. And, and so the idea was to get feedback from people, because people at that point had a chance to watch something and then give me feedback. And that's very, very, very important, because you just don't know what people don't get. People right. don't get the difference between nearsighted and farsighted. They don't get it. No. And no matter how time many times you talk about it, that's that's a real challenge for us, you know, to try to get past that kind. And also this whole thing. Nobody knows anything about their eyes. They don't know why they're wearing glasses. It's not explained to them in 20 minutes that they get. And so um, so that's those are the the hurdles that I'm trying to get over. But one of the one of the positive things that happened just recently and which yeah. is one of the reasons in LA is that Sony has developed a camera for uh, visually impaired people, young and old. I'm going to show yeah. it to you. Um, this is this is the camera. Okay, so it looks like a standard camera, but it's got a a, a big thing yeah. on the back. Yeah, it's a standard camera, and it has but it has on the back. Uh, it's mounted onto this thing. And so the eyepiece is here. And what happens, can you see the, yeah. can you see the eyepiece? Yeah. That sends a that sends a light laser directly to the retina of people who are visually impaired, either by high myopia or some other impairment. And and uh, and it allows them not only to take pictures or movies, but also in uh, in Japan, where it's made, they, uh, they, this, some people use this as a way of, um, of, of traveling themselves. They don't need to 
they don't need to do the movie. They can show, hold a camera up to the, to the flight, departing flights thing, you know, and see it. So, so Sony gave me, allowed me to test this yeah. for the film. And, uh, and okay. so, and I want to get into the background of that too, how it was made, why, you know, that'll be another angle of the film, but it's, I wanted to, not just that you have to get, you know, contact lenses or these special eyeglasses, which are available in different parts of the world. Um, but there are also other things happening that, uh, you know, vision is becoming big. Right. And, and so, you know, it's not just, it's not just a sad story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Well, what uh, what can um, our audience be expecting uh, with regards to the film in the coming uh, months or year? What's uh, what are some things that you're anticipating at this point? Well, we're going to start a new fundraising drive because we need more money. Um, the the be- budget for this film was seven hundred thousand dollars, and we raised mm-hmm. a little more than two hundred thousand. Mm. So. And a lot of people have been putting in their time because they believe in this project, but we right. really need to, you know, we need to get past this kind of amateur giving your own time uh, stage to, um, and so uh, what, if you go to the website, you can donate. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have donated. So I decided to, since there's so much interest in a short piece, that doctors could use or um, teachers could use and something, something that just sort of gives an idea of what this is. It's not a television. It's not made for television. It's made to let people know what this is. And those who have seen it really want it. Mm-hmm. So anyone who's given up to this date will, and anybody who gave their time for this will receive a 20, 25 minute, we're calling it the trainer. Mm-hmm. And, and from, now going forward anyone who gives two hundred dollars or more will automatically receive a 20 to 25 minute uh, video Mm -hmm. um and that will be called saving our children's eyes to distinguish it clearly from the tv movie and so as soon as we start getting enough fun to get back into business um we're we're going to keep going and i want to finish this by this time next year for sure yeah okay so so jane the the video that um you know is 20 to 25 minutes that's going to be educational to patients and their parents and talk about myopia it'd be the sort of thing where as a clinician I could pass this information off to my patients and then they would be able to have a better understanding of what we're doing in the office. Is that kind of a good summary of that? Exactly. It was what you, I I sent you a link to something similar, but Treehouse Eyes has used that. They tested it uh, early on and everybody wanted it because it really, it, instead of a five minute animation, it gets into it more and people get a, a good sense of what's going on. Yeah. Um, we need to tweak it some, and there are rights issues because we we took a lot of images that we need now to pay. We have to pay off the licensing because that, unlike television, which is you know a totally different ball game for licensing. Um, if you're selling something commercially, that you can't use anybody else's images without paying them for that right. commercial use. Right. So. Jane, that where out. can people go to find um, find the video? And we'll link it in the descriptions as well. Right. But uh, let us know. what Where should we be okay. heading for that? It's www.brewster, B-R-E-W-S-T-E-R, Pond, P-O-N-D, Productions, with an S, dot com. All right. And that... Everything's there, and yeah. there are two levels. So there's a first page, and then there's a support page, which gives you all the background of how much money we need and where we are, and timelines and things like that. So super. It's, it's all done graphically, so you don't have to read through a lot of stuff. 
Yeah, so. well, if nothing else, I want to make sure everybody knows that this is you know, available. It's uh, hopefully going to be available sooner than later, which would indicate that you're getting the funding that you're needing. Um, everybody can go and see at least a two minute teaser on this at that at, at, at brewsterpondproductions.com and um, see the great work that's already come about. Um, I've, I've had a chance to see nearly the entire thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is just a fantastic production. And Really grateful for you putting this on on the behalf of millions of children and uh, eye care providers that are out there. So we're really grateful for your uh, your dedication in this, Jane. I have one last thing to say. Please. And that is the educational arm, distribution arm of public television in the United States. It's called NETA, N-E-T-A. They have approved this film for broadcast, even though it's not finished because of my long, long career of filmmaking, mm -hmm. they were willing to take the risk, which means that any major corporations that want to support the broadcast, that means they get their blurb at the beginning, uh, can do so. And okay. all you have to do is contact me um, and, uh, and my email, just to make it all easy, is Productions at gmail.com. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you, Jane. It was uh, a pleasure to get to hang out with you. And thanks for being part of the podcast. Oh, I'm, uh, it's really a pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah. And, and I'll see you again. <laughs> yes, I hope so. And with thank you for joining us news. for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for future episodes of the Myopia Podcast. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.